Yeah, the vice president at Hunt Community College um, did come down with positive test of COVID. And unfortunately, she said, I'm coughing too much this morning. I can't zoom in. So we wish her the best, but she won't be here. But with us is uh, Dr. Michelle Schneider, who was a colleague or a partner of mine at Clinton Community College, and she'll talk about her pathway, but we reconnected. She is now the Dean of Health, Science, and Criminal Justice at SUNY Camp. Um, also, Dan King is our connection through CFES. We forged, forged a great partnership with the Development Corporation in Clinton County, um, and she's going to talk a little bit about her pathway. So, ladies, if you can do your an individual introduction and talk about your pathway, STEM, partnerships, engagements, and how we are here today. Dr. Schneider? Sure. Um, so I'm going to stand up because that's the teacher in me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I just want to talk a little bit about my pathway because I do think it's a little bit unique. Um, I actually started out in healthcare and I was an x-ray technologist and I did MRI and CAT scan. And I really appreciated what we were talking about this morning because uh, that humanistic idea about the difference between work and a job. And when I was in high school, I loved math and science, didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I didn't know that I wanted to help people. And so it turned out that there was a two-year program um, with Empire State College and partnering with uh, the local hospital in, uh, in x-ray and radiology. And so I shadowed somebody and I just fell in love with it. And so I worked in radiology for almost 10 years before I decided to go back to school because I just didn't get enough of the biology and the chemistry and I really loved that. But that humanistic approach is really what got me engaged. It wasn't sitting and studying with, you know, in front of a book or memorizing things. I did love science and math, but um, that visit to the hospital made all the difference for me. So I decided to go back to school though, because I wanted to do a little bit more. I thought about going into uh, public school uh, teaching, but I really was interested in research. So um, I ended up getting my uh, um, BS in biology and a minor in chemistry. And then somebody who has now become a lifelong friend and colleague when I was uh, uh, in my bachelor's uh, program, just about ready to graduate, she said, you know, you would be really, really great at the college level. And I am no longer, I'm going to exit Sandy Laterell, you know, Sandy, right? And she's I'm exiting and you would be great. And I thought, well, I don't know. Um, but she mentored me and I ended up adjuncting at Clinton Community College for a couple of years. And then a position opened. I had finished my master's in the meantime at SUNY Oxford in um, natural sciences and did research in cellular biochemistry. And I became a professor at Clinton Community College for almost 15 years. And I didn't even think that I would ever go into administration, <laughs> but um, had the opportunity um, at the college and uh, stayed there for a couple of years, moved on to Sydney Broom Community College, uh, worked uh, with a lot of folks at the university, local workforce development. And so all along the way, though, I had folks who, you know, embraced me, embraced my energy, and maybe not officially mentored me, but really, um, you know, took me by the hand and said, we'd love to have you come and join us in workforce development and be and make um, some meaningful um, efforts in our community to support our youth and business partners, industry partners. And so I find myself back here in, in the uh, North Country at SUNY Canton as the Dean of Science, Health and Criminal Justice and really enjoying uh, my role there. So um, that's my story. I think all along the way though, I just want to emphasize that it really was more um, about not the job, but what I was doing for my community, what I was doing for um, all of the students that I interacted with uh, throughout my entire career up to now and uh, how I can make where I'm at a better place. So 
So. Well, I know. Morning, Danny. I will blind myself with the projector because I can't stay focused on the same spots and then sit down because that's safer. Um, so yes, I am Danny Payne. I grew up in the North Country uh, of New York, which used to be a twin story. I grew up in Malone, New York, um, and went to SUNY Plattsburgh, the big city. And uh, I studied public relations, and I wanted to be an inventor. So my final uh, semester in undergrad, I had a really great internship with the city, and uh, my internship supervisor said, hey, I have a connection over the Chamber of Commerce. They have a, uh, an events and marketing position that's coming available uh, first of the year. Um, I graduated in December, so it's like, perfect. Great. I, uh, I was commencement speaker, so I had that kind of like confidence that only a 21 year old has never been really in the course has. And so I bought my first suit and was like, nailed the interview in the bag. I really didn't get the job. Uh, but they gave me a call a few weeks later and said, you know what? We like uh, your energy and we need someone part time to help set up the conference room and answer problems. So I figured it was a foot in the door, started sending my resume everywhere, took it on as a second job. Three months into that, they said, hey, we need an assistant in economic development. No idea what economic development meant, but at that point it meant salary and health insurance. So I said, absolutely. And it was the best move I made. In that role, I had a phenomenal mentor and she helped to really introduce me to the impact that uh, economic developers have in the community. So in that role, our main role was business attraction. We're working to attract companies, um, mostly foreign companies, to come to the Plattsburgh region uh, and bring their jobs with them. So we're meeting all of these really interesting people, these innovative companies, um, and helping them to set up shop in our town. Um, and to see that kind of tangible return of, you know, the signs going up on the building, it was kind of nice. Like, hey, I know they're hiring and they hired someone that I graduated with. And you can kind of draw these connections. So I decided that was what I wanted to do. So I went back uh, to school online and I got my master's in community and economic development through SUNY Empire. And uh, that was a brand new master's program at the time. I was the first cohort. And they uh, positioned it so that you could have a, a graduate certificate in your studies. So I kind of closed my eyes and picked one that I kind of thought, oh, this is great. And that was workforce development. Um, and through that program, I then you know, got a lot more interested in what I was doing at the chamber and how workforce development played into that. So, you know, pre pandemic, unemployment was so low, people needed employees. and being someone who grew up in the country, I understood the message of anywhere but here. You can't be successful unless you move to a big city. And I really wanted to work for you with that. Um, and, you know, it doesn't matter if you're in Chattagay or Chicago, it's all about building your relationships and kind of seeing how you can make it interesting. Uh, so in 2019, I moved over to TC, which owns uh, and operates industrial parks in the country. So in my role, originally, I was just using industrial space, some of the basic economic development type stuff. And then after recognizing um, some of the work that I was doing before and where my interests really were, uh, my, my boss at TBC said, hey, let's change your position. And they adjusted it to include workforce development. So now I was able to really put my feet on the ground and get into it with our tenants and those in the manufacturing community to say, how can we retain some of these young people in Plattsburgh? How can we give them global opportunities? And we're not just saying, hey, don't worry about this, just come get a job here. It's these companies are huge global corporations for sure. You're going to work every day, but in Plattsburgh, but you could go to Norway or Germany and have all these really wonderful experiences through this career opportunity. Um, and so I recognized pretty quickly as I started developing this programming and workforce that business and education don't speak the same language. Uh, and our employers were so frustrated because they just couldn't get through the door to the school. They just didn't know how to access the kids, how to engage with them. And so I didn't do either, um, but I was determined to find a way. 
and then someone introduced me. <laughs> and we had a few conversations about CFES and what they were doing and how we could um, partner. And it has been uh, just a really fantastic opportunity for not only the companies within our industry park, but across the North country to um, really have the opportunity to engage students and to host webinars, bring the students into manufacturing facilities. I think that's one of the biggest things that you, know, you don't recognize because you're doing it every day is a lot of people don't know what modern manufacturing looks like. You know, it's not the industrial revolution where everything is loud and it's dirty and you're standing on an assembly line doing the same thing over and over. The companies, even, oh, you know, lots from New York, they're really innovative. They're using robotics. They're, I mean, some of the technology that's used within our parks is one of a kind. And they're contributing to the global marketplace. So we hosted a um, free coffee day. Now, if any of you are in the Plattsburgh region and you know about the, the mobile coffee cart, um, it's a legend. And so we hosted uh, the coffee cart in our industrial park to try to draw some, some people out. And I just stood around and I was listening to what people saying. And the number one thing they said was, wow, I had no idea how much was back here. And these were people who were, who were adults. They were working, you know, I could see their badges. They were going to the school next door, the technical school. They were, you know, working in the community. And it's, if they don't know what's here, you know, our, the students definitely don't know. And the kids really don't have, you know, this knowledge of what's right in their own backyard. So that has been um, missing us for a while now and uh, having a lot of fun doing it. Okay. Well, I'm glad we met. I don't remember who introduced us, but maybe it was Dr. Small. I'm not sure. But <laughs> so, you know, I mean, we we have, you know, the three of us, and actually we carry the four of us have a passion to get kids real learning, authentic experiences, you know, particularly in the fields of STEM. But, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be STEM because, you know, these companies have marketing jobs and they have jobs that don't technically fall into that role of step. But you know, you've had great experiences. You know, we're building a great partnership um, with our college partners in the North Country. TVC is definitely leading the business side of the triangle as we call it. Share some of the experiences that you have had, whether it's been in the North Country, I know Dr. Shine had a wonderful experience in Boone County. Um, talk about some of the things that you have done that we can take back to our schools that they can take back and say, okay, this, this is an idea I think we can get off the ground and or helping CFBS, CFBS help them get some of those real life learning experiences to expose kids to opportunities in particular rural regions too. Yeah, I think that's a great yeah, there's there's a lot that we can do. So you know, uh, I'm not even for the manufacturing day of the month. Okay. So there's a lot of different ways that, that plays out in, in a community. Um, but another way uh, that we could engage um, both our industry partners uh, in the public schools and higher ed, so it's that triangle, right, uh, where we all meet. <laughs> Um, and one of the things that we, we've done um, from, uh, from where I was before was we held an event where on our college campus that had um, industry partners actually leading with our faculty um, hands-on activities you know, across the campus. So it wasn't just STEM. I was doing STEM and sciences. But so it was in both of those areas, but also in other areas, in the liberal arts and business area as well. But the industry partners actually came on campus and went into our labs and worked with the students. And we had something like 2,000 students on campus. And I, I didn't lead that. That was actually a more community effort, but we were partnered with that and hugely successful. And then we'll be again. So, uh, hopefully they get that up and running again, but that was wildly successful, just, you know, dozens of buses rolling in, and it was a really meaningful day for the students. Um, a lot of work at the higher ed end, but, um, but well worth it. Um, and though that was for seventh and eighth graders, 
stepping back even further, and my long-term colleague and friend, way in back, Kelly, <laughs> from Glendale Community uh, College, who uh, knows about this effort. So one of the programs that I uh, held at Clinton, this is when I was a full-time faculty member, actually, was a STEM outreach program. And we, I did that for almost know, seven or eight years. And I had fifth graders on campus uh, in June. And hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids every year came through that program. And again, it was all hands on, it was local community members to get the kids engaged. And it goes back to starting very early in the elementary schools um, to uh, get students engaged with, I can do this. Um, and it's I engage in students as well. But it all links back to what the employers uh, were looking for. And they wanted to be engaged. I think right now we're at a point, uh, an inflection point, right? The workforce development, higher education, and yet we know that both ends of that spectrum, right? The, the employers and higher ed, we need to do more for our students. And now is the time to really be more creative and to be uh, better partners with one another so that we can get the workforce. You know, you bring up a really bad point, fifth grade experience. Mm -hmm. you, you know, Dr. Matthew Singh will put a basketball and football, you know, in kids' hands by the age of five, but kids don't necessarily have real STEM experiences, maybe even until they get into a science lab in middle or, or senior high school. Uh, so, you know, that, that is important. And, you know, I, I know, Danny, that you have a lot of ideas and you've done some things, but what, what kind of things, um, experiences have you provided and how can we engage younger students to our business connections? Sure. So, you know, traditionally, um, TDC is supporting workforce development in more of a behind the scenes partner that supported the science fairs and contributed to things like that. Um, and when I came on board, started to want to really ramp up that, that hands on experience within these facilities. So I mean, the employers have a vested interest as well. I mean, they need a pipeline um, and they want to see, you know, what the students that are going to be the employees of the future, uh, what they value and, and how to engage with them, you know, getting them in the facilities is a big part of that. So, um, you know, this past spring, we were able to do our first on-site facility towards the pandemic. Brought about 150 eighth graders through um, six different manufacturers to Plattsburgh, um, which was really, you know, drop in the bucket um, as far as how many students that are out there in the community. But it was a really great first step uh, in trying to familiarize them with, you know, what career exploration looks like and, you know, look at the jobs these people are doing and what their day to day looks like and what do you like? What do you maybe want to change and do differently? Um, so they can really understand uh, where their strengths are as far as um, their career trajectory. And so, you know, we've done other virtual reach outs, but I think with webinars and Zooms, I think not even just students, everybody's so zoomed down. I mean, trying to engage with kids when you're face to face is tough enough. Trying to engage with that group of your students is just, it's very difficult. And so, to be able to you know be there in front of them and have representatives of these companies who's engaging and can get on their level and understand how to um, you know interact with them in a way that is valuable to spend um, you know our best and to increase in the coming year. So um, yesterday I had the uh, West Point Astrobiotics team in one of my presentations, and they have a challenge every year from NASA to build, well, this is the challenge they had last year, was to build a mining machine, you know, a robot that would go to the moon and mine to the surface of the moon, bring back the materials so they can determine what are the elements on the moon. So because the, the goal is that there will be eventually some inhabitation on the moon for space travel on the moon. So in a, in a broader picture, that's an authentic STEM experience. But those are college kids, those are engineers, they're astrophysicists. What kind of authentic opportunities can businesses and colleges provide for schools? And, and I know they have so many resources to do this. I guess on the reverse side, how can the schools engage them 
to give them the opportunity to bring someone into a fourth or fifth grade class or middle school technology class. Um, you know, because we have a lot of rural schools. I mean, I, I know about some of our guests here. Um, they may not have a chamber of commerce, but how can they do it? You know, what is the best way you think to get kids these experiences? An authentic STEM experience. Not quite like us. You know, we, you know, we have some friends at NASA, but I'm not quite sure we're going to be able to do that. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Um, um, so I think that finding a partner is the, the best way to go about this. And, you know, when you start to talk about that extended experiences, it, it brings up um, a rather new initiative in our community um, that is through the workforce partnership, but then all of these other um, support organizations, including TBC, um, that are looking to make this a reality. And it's actually called off the um, but they found a company that was willing to provide a real manufacturing problem. That they actually, you know, there was this piece of their process that was taking, you know, additional labor hours and it just needed to be streamlined. They didn't have the resources and to just put any real engineering effort. So our workforce partnership coordinated students in an engineering type classroom with a cohort of students in Germany. And they addressed this problem with the company. Interesting enough, their first question was, well, what happens to the person whose job it is to do this? And I think that's just really reinforces what we heard this morning um, in what the next generation was really valuing in the work that they're doing. Um, in which the answer was that they would be still retrained and would keep their jobs. Um, but it really just reinforces, you know, that the global market is in your backyard. And so these students worked together um, and actually by the end of it had a complete production ready blueprint of a solution presented in the problem. And the feedback from the students was that, you know, now they see what, you know, company culture can be like in the manufacturing facility, what type of impact they can have. Um, and they got to work with you know international students to see how things are done you know halfway across the world um and when you live in a rural community that doesn't really seem like it's something that you have an opportunity to do and so they're expanding that program into the middle schools and uh, trying to expand it but it was just really great to see them have this experience where at the end of the day they can say hey i influence this like this is the tangible result of my work and uh, it's really exciting to see that program grow. This is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Dr. Schneider, how are you? So having been at two year institutions, now four year institution, you know, I mean when you talk about STEM and we talk about college for every student, the CIPS is looking at it from the aspect of anything postgraduate high school. You know, being able to set credentials uh, from a two year school or um, stay at the two year school on your four year school and all the way up to a, a PhD. So, you know, how can higher ed, as well as business partners, but how can higher ed help students understand that have an affinity maybe for mass science and technology? Um, you know, you can go beyond high school, these are great careers, and you need to be able to look at. All of the pathways uh, in STEM that can stay in our communities. You know, again, like we are focused a little bit more on rural communities at this point, uh, but certainly they can be urban. Uh, how can we do that collaboratively between what this is college and high school partners and middle school partners? Yeah, that's, um, it sounds like it might be something that could be easily done, but it's not. It's, it is a real challenge. Um, I think higher ed actually has some work to do. Uh, we need to be very honest about that. And um, I think it was said even earlier at one of the other sessions, we really need to be transparent about what it is that a student gets from their higher education experience, right? It's, it is, sure, you, you like to be able to, you know, graduate and have a skill, um, but, but is it more than that? You know, what is it? Um, so I do think we need to be a little bit more transparent about what we get out of that two-year or that four-year degree and how we get that throughout that whole process. And um, 
to really identify the path more clearly. Right now, it's a lot of use quality. We have a lot of degrees. We have even certificates, uh, two year degrees, four year degrees, but the path is pretty windy for some students. All right. And, you know, one of the other comments that was made, I think, earlier uh, by Dr. Mackey, actually, I mean, basically, um, he was told really how many times that he just wasn't probably would be too successful, <laughs> you know. Um, I literally was told that I would not be successful in college. And um, <laughs> I was too. Yeah. And, it, you know, so whatever it is, uh, you know, students are not fitting into the perceived, you know, round peg into the round hole. And so we need to be very honest about how we can support our students prior to coming to um, higher ed and how we can partner so that they do have the skills to be successful, both um, not just uh, in their schoolwork, but also as a community. Right, and it goes back to those essential skills, and it does go back to um, understanding what the foundation for uh, should be or uh, foster right in the high school, uh, if, uh, no, from the time you get into school all the way up into higher ed. So, um, I just I think higher ed needs to be a little bit more transparent about what it is we need to be successful, and we need to partner better with. Uh, high schools and uh, public schools to, to make that happen. But along the way, there could be better partnerships with, say, micro credentials. And probably everybody in here has heard of micro credentials. But what do you really hang your hat on, right? And it really goes back to what are some of those um, competencies that the workforce is looking for? And then how do you go from these little packets of skills, right? into maybe a certificate, into a two-year certificate. But what can we do maybe at the school level, right? To make that pathway a little bit more transparent and those little nuggets or those little packages of competencies and skills might trigger somebody to say, wow, I really do like math and science. I really do uh, like account, you know, business. I really do like that I live in manufacturing. I like to tinker. But it's never really been fostered. And so maybe those little packets of the nuggets of competencies that we can give a student to, you know, to say, hey, you're good at this, and you just earned this little micro credential. And let's move you, you know, into another class to see if you, you know, want to broaden your understanding of that. So it's kind of a windy path, I think, but we need to be more clear about how you get from point A to point B and provide all of the supports along the way. So that workforce has what they what they need, and so the partnership is it's complicated. Uh, you know, I think you made a really valid point. You know, for those of you who don't know, SUNY Canton, SUNY Canton is a, is a very unique four year institution. It started out as a two when I was in college, it was called SUNY Canton Pat, uh, Canton ATC. Um, it's a very hands on college, um, and they have credentials. Two year programs, they do a lot of partnership with businesses. Mm -hmm. Regionally, how can the kids, you know, from the business side, the end, you know, you're, you're looking for a workforce pipeline. How can you say to kids, okay, these are competencies we're hoping for? This is, you could go to these colleges, you don't have to get a four year degree. Right, if you do, the kid gets inspired or whatever. How can businesses do that in, in engaging middle and high school kids? So I think that, you know, like higher ed, and also have students to do with kind of really taking a closer look at what they are looking for, for their for the future, um, and get beyond the I just need them to show up mindset. Um, you know, I think that we're just been very tight for a while. So, you know, a lot of the four years are just frustrated and um, it's, it can be difficult to kind of pull out what you're looking for. Um, and, you know, engaging with students and just trying to, you know, get on their level and see what they value as well. You know, a lot of the companies um, in our parks are, like Richard or Lucky, we do have, you know, a culture system with values that the next generation for. 
Um, but how do they relay that information in a way that will just understand what they need to do to get a job there? So part of that is um, more, you know, just hands on and face to face interactions, maybe faction day, which we never know. Um, really challenge our employers this year to do something that's engaging. So you're not just standing behind a table with a, a white cloth and a table tent that says the name of the company, smiling and nodding, because you're not going to get a 13 or 14 year old to walk up and say, hey, what do I need to do to get a job here? No, we need to. They need to really, um, you know, make the extra effort to engage with the students and say, hey, you know, here, um, you know, do this activity or do something that hands on to start the conversation um, in a way where they can say, okay, this is what you like to do. Well, you, for our facility, you just need a computer degree or you need a certificate in this. Um, but it's being willing to, um, you know, really kind of get the students level. And a lot of our employers are starting to recognize that. Really excited about that. It's exciting to actually day. You know, that, that is a very, very valid point. I think I'm on that committee. We are on that committee. Um, I think there's over 650 kids signed up. Um, so that's exciting. You know, one of my hopes out of this, and, and I think this is very crucial, this was actually a tenant of the original feedback grant, um, getting business partners to understand the value of mentoring and getting colleges to understand the value of mentoring because in your initial introductions, you both mentioned significant people in your lives who were mentors, and, and certainly we all have that. Um, you know, what I learned as a school principal, businesses are not going to give you money for projects. They are more inclined to give you some time, you know, or materials and supplies if you had a science fair or some type of STEM competition. How can high schools, middle schools, our schools, no matter what level, really get a legitimate mentor program with business and college partners. That is a significant area that if we can break that barrier down, I think that would open up the floodgates. I have a question, um, especially to see again. So, I took two students to the National Science Fair last year in New York. We got three miles um, for the whole project. Um, we were seeing a drastic decrease in the amount of schools in our in the St. Lawrence Regional Science Fair. Um, and what we noticed, taking like a rural North Country group down there, was that um, we wanted to do this quick for the girls to see because they were in New York when they when they got down there. Most of those schools. All of those kids were on college campuses using their lines. So our kids were like, you know, in the middle school classroom trying to figure it out. Um, so even if that's a partnership that we could start getting some of these kids who want to go to that next level with a mentor on a college campus using their equipment and that next level of scientific thinking that we can't provide at the middle school level is something that we have to schools. That's an awesome idea. That's an awesome idea. Yeah. It is. Um, I got a one last year, and then there's only. I mean, for the kids, um, they are that one. Um, same thing that she went on to Syracuse, um, to the state conference, uh, conference there. There were maybe eight to nine kids in that there. Um, then our, our regional, which is City Potsdam runs, um, I just got a video because they were like, they were like, we do not have it. Um, and that was where these kids got to go to Georgia. Um, it can be, when we went to Georgia, there are 80 different countries and 1,800 different So it's, if those North American kids can get there and see what's that next step, and then we spend a whole week with these kids who, or, I mean, they go to like science academy, and that's all I'm thinking about. It just makes me hot to learn so much from these, you know, these 10th and 11th graders there. Um, because it's brilliant, and they're so interested that it rubs off on the other ones, you know. And so, it, they, they just need to be surrounded by that. So, if we can get them, we realize that all the little kids were like, How do you work on the project? How is it high level? And like, I mean, it was like those projects where you're like, somebody else is doing this one. Day. You know what I mean? And then you realize it's because one day a week, they're going to, you know, to these places in New York City, these colleges are going to their last 
they're working with grad students and um, and if there are projects that they have to mentor their students higher level and we can offer them and that's what we're really cool with but you, you know you can link five minutes in one year to it um, because they have scholarship money when you go to ISAP and then the students have it. they just don't they, they're not realizing that the longer you stay into um, science fair networking and now she's you know, my daughter started with kids from all over the country that she met in one week. And um, so all these things that we're teaching with the country skills are really we can keep those programs going. Uh, and then you give them female scholarships. It's amazing. Yeah, that's a, I love that idea. I I, mean, I'm, I'm curious, that. I get put you on the spot, but this is you put me on the spot. Okay. <laughs> high school is yeah. done for me, it's done in the industry. Right. What does science fair look like in a more urban? Um, do they have partnerships where the kids can go and well so we have a number of partnerships. I think they've been about science fairs and not that they not uh, consistent in, in our high school uh per se, but we have a couple of partnerships with uh local companies, local families. You know, GE still has its multiple shifts that have swept camp past the end of one years ago. Um, but our kids have access to the science fair and we have to use to be inspired when they have our kids work on projects for 10 weeks in the fall. And then we have to the push this time because they can see the work for five months away and they can solve it. But I'd love to see the science fair come back. You know, um, I think it would be really important for people to be able to share what they do. And that's kind of what we're building into our design of the school and the actual project where kids can be on STEM. Uh, we're just going to share out uh, something that we're working on. And, what I have been kind of set up with that is for the national project fall of the fall of the UN's um, 17 goals for sustainable development. <clears throat> um, looking at that for all of the very communities that we have business, the applied arts, humanities, because then kids can kind of transfer to the most interesting communities that they like it so much, and it's still underneath the, the UN's the goal. So, our science fair is even what you're talking about, which is kind of disappointing what we have our opportunities. So it sounds like STEM challenges. Yeah. And I think that's kind of what I was leading up to because I knew you had a partnership with General Electric and um you make a valid point about the, the 17 sustainable goals for, for the UN. And, and if you're not familiar with those as educators, you should look them up. We actually hosted a, a leadership summit, uh, environmental leadership summit last year. With one of the ambassadors in a big one young. Um, but I think going back to you know what Tiffany is saying and the question I had asked, are we better off having professors and businesses maybe propose STEM challenges, you know, um, where they have to get some research together and build a mentoring system like that? You know, to see if we can get engineers, um, you know, from the business side or industrial managers or whatever, and college professors, and even better yet, college students. I mean, the the fostering of mentoring through college students to high school so students would probably be more engaging. No offense to college professors. I mean, no, no, I, I agree. I, one of the things that we did at Quorum actually was host a robotics competition, and we were congratulated uh, with the teachers. They part. They had. There's a challenge, and and then uh, the schools all come together to show off their work. And um, it was. It's why it was wildly successful. It still is, I'm sure. And um, but that's it. There's a, there's a real challenge, and um, it's an opportunity for industry and higher ed. And my um, computer science faculty actually mentored high school students. So there was a real uh, strong partnership there, and then we just the events that we need. So um, 
you know, there are opportunities. The other thing I will also say, it really is about partnerships and linking it to the work to workforce development. One of the other uh, efforts that came to fruition was um, I actually ended up getting a new visions engineering science program on uh, college campus in, in my applied tech building. And they basically had their program there. They rented, they, we didn't even rent the space to them. It was just a, you know, we'd love to have you here. And it was an opportunity for them, the students, to see what it looked like in and had a college. They were already taking some of our courses because of the enrollment. And we weren't getting a whole lot of students from that from that group, New Visions Engineering, maybe four students a year or something like that. Um, we doubled that after that first year. So it doesn't sound like a lot, but when you only have a class of 20 that are graduating from that small program and they're, they're coming to a community college first, you know, we have an engine, we had an engine science program, then you know that is very, very meaningful. But it is about that is about the challenges, you know, and really getting them to think about their real life applications so that we get the workforce that we need. So I think it's a good one. Uh, there's, a, there's a nationwide partnership called the Base Mentorship, which you can reach out and you can the base to our connection with construction and very mentorship program. Um, we have in the capital district, but like, literally all over the entire country, and they can get kids access to architects, construction designers, engineers, and they do work on projects that are like globally impactful. So, <laughs> Two years ago, the project was how do we do um, you know, historical renovation on top seals where the school would be updated with that sort of like historical impact that we have. So, just things of that nature are what we can work on, and they do it collaboratively. So, we have a team right out of Slinky High School um, that would work together, but then the region decided that they wanted students to work in the public schools. So, they did it at Slinky High School, which is the district now. You know, teach from all the schools that are down. In fact, this will go there, get teams, and then they work on this project for like six, ten weeks. Um, but that's something that they're always looking for schools to throw in and out. They can get to lots of things going on the street. So, I understand. All right. Um, I've got one more question for our panelists, and then if there are additional questions, and I kind of just, after listening to Dr. Thomas speak, talk oh, far size. Yes, these suggestions because I'm from Wyoming and a lot of the things that you guys are saying, sending kids to places to work. And I like the like virtual experiences, but so many of our high schools are more hours from any kind of community college, and most of the community colleges don't have a STEM program mm -hmm. since it's Wyoming. Um, so I was wondering if you guys have any suggestions on how to get the hands on experience. A lot of other things we couldn't afford to give that to students if they have something like that. What's the primary industry? Um, <laughs> that's where you go. But there's a lot of like agriculture. Um, do you have like a, a chamber of commerce or a business organization that supports? I'm not sure. And the other thing is, too, we have a lot of communities that are so spread out that it's hard to get anything like that. Like, we do have those things. Like, High schools where there's only 20 kids, and there's so many like an hour of the week from like any kind of place that has anything like that. So. Yeah, to, to put perspective on it, I mean, there are, I think I heard yesterday, it's been 28 one room schoolhouses still in the state of Wyoming mm -hmm. for Wyoming and she, mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, the total, the total population of students that are graduating across the state is 290,000 students. So, you know, considering where my panelists are, my only looks like in New York, it is traffic, you think. Mm -hmm. um, and virtual is an option. Do you have any infrastructure that would support um, grants or anything like that? I guess I'm thinking being mobile units, like a STEM mobile unit. And I, that, that would take money, but I think it, what I, I whatever your state ed department is, there might be some grant funding for that. I don't know how things are organized in the state of Miami, but um, it, it sounds like because of the rural nature that some mobile type of 
still open might be fruitful. I mean, I don't know who organizes that or how to get them going, but I, I mean, the distances between all of those histories that you're talking about and the numbers does, you know, that is challenging. Or they may be able to get others to rotate that. That's something on the outcome of the Dr. Thomas file. Um, you know, one of the things that did come out of the pandemic, which, you know, there are there were certainly some positives. Um, CFES is partnered with a global corporation called SAIC. It's a scientific research company. It's probably the largest scientific research company in the world. And they also hold a lot of government contracts. That's about how our connection to NASA is. Uh, they will put out virtual mentors for us. Uh, we had a mentor uh, from Texas a couple of years ago that did a rocket launch challenge for an elementary school. And this engineer soon didn't enter the classroom to eat their families. And we worked with the kids in the top you know, And the funny thing about this, he was actually a very natural teacher because he never gave an answer to a problem. He would just pose different questions and give kids to think it's roof. Um, you know, that would certainly be something that you know, I, I can talk to you about this afterwards, but you can if you're looking for virtual staff mentors, you do have quarterly partners to do that. Um, and that that could pose challenges and then send it back into the rest. But you know, that's that's a great question. Uh, and then, you know, yesterday morning I was talking to people. We definitely have different types of economic needs, you know, and everything to stands the lower. But you know, I would say one, if we, if we can find you a partner or to the university, we can find you a partner. You know, we have to be able to challenge, you know, um, but maybe possibly at some point kind of things could get out of campus um, and we kind of do a shallow sand robotic challenge and everything. Even if it's just something that is, you know, not a simple to move in the context or even if it's just a Or even, um, you know, instead of trying to take a whole busload of kids four hours away, uh, maybe encouraging some of your teachers to take advantage of some professional development universities where it may be easier for them to find the means to um, have some like, support professional development or something where they're. Going into a manufacturing facility and getting the understanding that they can then integrate into their curriculum with students during the school year. And the other thing that I forgot about this too, but uh, many years ago, um, I was the liaison between all of the high schools for um, our science and programming. And one of the things that I looked at was what was the type of equipment they had in the, in the school to deliver a college of course, and that, right? And it, it, I discovered that there were some shortfalls, significant shortfalls. So I actually worked with the foundation and um, got $25,000 brain ads and started an equipment on your front. And so I don't know um, if that's something that it's not established. I mean, that's, an, that's a pretty yeah. easy lift, I think, for, I for our college to do something like that. And and then, you know, part of what I would do right to the equipment um, if I had a timely form and thing. But um, that might be a, an easier lift than, you know, a mobile app situation. But I think you, the universities and the community colleges, they, they might be able to help them move away from that person. We have any other questions? I, I do want to pose one more question and I can open it up to everybody, you know. But is there any other question for our panelists before I just throw one last thought out? Okay. So this morning, Dr. Thomas um, talked about the profile of the graduate. You know, and most of us know the profile of the graduate was written in the late 1800s. Mm -hmm. um, and we are all based, our education system is based on the agrarian model. Um, you know, schools were set up like factories, so kids got used to being going to work in a factory or on a farm. What do you perceive 
with the development of essential skills mentoring, what should be the profile of a graduate as we move forward in our new beginnings, you know, for access to college, success in college, success in the workforce, you know, because the profile of graduate is now significantly different than the original concept of the profile of graduate. And I know it's a problem, but. Um, so I'm going to catch this in my own experience because I went back to school for my PhD, much older, and but I graduated from you know higher ed, right? Um, and I think that the profile graduate has to be has to include willingness to be in the moment, and and always be willing to learn something you know otherwise we're, we're never going to be prepared for the for the next job we don't i don't know what the new jobs are going to be in 10 years um but i might be doing one of them and i have to be able to be flexible and willing to learn i was really struck by the fact at the beginning of this opening um uh, session uh that you know i'm like, getting the gentleman's name the first gentleman that spoke Oh, okay. but um, anyway, he, he made yeah he he made note um that you know how much of your knowledge are you actually using that that you went to school for, and sure biology chemistry I was teaching obviously, um but in general you're not using a whole lot but it's the collection of those experiences it's my collection of my life experience that I'm using as I move forward. And as I had left, you know, first my associate's degree and for x-ray was a math and science degree. Um, I was just simply applying my skills, but it was never enough because I was always willing to learn more and do more. Uh, you know, MRI was new uh, on the scene. I'm dating myself a little bit. <laughs> uh, but um, I was just like, this is an unbelievable technology. And um, I was fascinated by it. And so rather than just doing CAT scan, I was uh, the first technologist, myself and another gal, who been training at our local hospital for the first unit in our area and became the first MRI certified technologist for our hospital. And um, so I just think what I would like to see for graduate is just the willingness to learn because it doesn't matter what job you go to. You're going to be successful if you have a willingness to learn because then you're motivated and people see that. I think that that's essential. Um, I would just add the willingness to learn, as you mentioned, but also while you're kind of challenging the way it's always been done. Um, you know, I think that. That's also something that our employers struggle with. Well, this is how we was recruited before. This is always how we've engaged with future employees before. It's a work for the next generation. Um, so, you know, as someone who's a graduate coming out of any educational platform going into you know, their first role, um, instead of just, okay, this is the job description, this is how it's always been done, but challenge that and, you know, forge new partnerships that might seem a little unorthodox because there are best practices that are in every corner of every industry. Um, and odds are um, it's been done in some way. And so learning from what works and what doesn't and what programs are out there and just learning from the people around you and trying to you know challenge wherever you are in the organization, um, whether it's in education or whether you're in you know, manufacturing or healthcare, um, you know, how it can be done a little more efficiently or better for the next generation. Thank you. Any closing questions, points? Okay. Appreciate you sitting in our last session. Dr. Thank Schneider, Ms. King, thank you so much. It's awesome. <laughs> Just as a reminder, if you haven't checked out, check out this analytics. <laughs> and we're close to it. Thank you, everybody.
Thank you. 